Good evening, everyone. My name is Varun Soni. I'm the Dean of Religious Life here at USC. And on behalf of the Office of Religious Life and USC Spectrum, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to our very special evening with Noah Levine. I'd especially like to thank Dane Martins and his uh, wonderful crew at USC Spectrum for all their hard work in putting today's event together. So let's hear it for Dane and Spectrum. Thank you. Here at USC, we have more student religious groups and more campus religious directors than any other university in the US. Uh, and we also reside in the middle of Los Angeles, uh, arguably the most religiously diverse city on the planet. So the convergence of these factors really gives us the uh, extraordinary opportunity to host events and programs like these. Events that bring together university students and research scholars, spiritual practitioners uh, and community and civic leaders. And our office is oriented around these ultimate questions of meaning, purpose, and identity. So that, those are the types of questions that these events um, interrogate, address. All of our events are free and open to the public. For people who are religious, spiritual, agnostic, we welcome you to all of the events. I just want to give you a heads up of a few upcoming events. Um, on Wednesday, um, next Wednesday, November 4th, for our What Matters to Me and Why series, we have Ralph Fertig, who's a uh, lawyer, a judge, an author, um, one of the great professors on our campus. He was a, a friend of Martin Luther King, an organizer for the March on Washington, um, advisor to Bobby Kennedy and, and Cesar Chavez. Um, so I invite you all to come. There is information in the back, and there's also an e-newsletter that you can sign up for. We're also hosting Kay Warren, um, who started the largest HIV AIDS ministry in the world that night, uh, Wednesday night, uh, the wife of Pastor Rick Warren. Um, and for those who are interested in meditation, we have weekly meditation uh, sessions um, on Wednesday at the Little Chapel of Silence at noon. And there's many meditation groups that you can join as well. And all that information is on the back table. So one of the great joys of my job is that I get to work with the most dynamic and creative religious and spiritual leaders in Los Angeles. And Noah is really on the top of that list. I have wanted to bring him here uh, to USC ever since I got here. So I'm happy we made it happen today. When I was in college, I struggled with the realization um, of impermanence that led to suffering. And for the first time, I experienced the impermanence of love and of life. Uh, and I began to identify with another Indian man who also struggled to understand his suffering, a prince by the name of Siddhartha who lived 2,500 years ago in what is now Nepal. And Siddhartha lived a very, power, uh, a, a, a very privileged life, filled with luxury, um, and um, one day as a young adult, he had a powerful experience of uh, suffering, witnessing firsthand the ravages of sickness, of old age, and of death. And he vowed to find the root cause of this suffering and to move beyond it. He embarked upon a spiritual journey that ended with him achieving enlightenment under a tree in a small village in India. And from there on out, he was known as the Buddha, or in Sanskrit meaning the one who has awakened. So inspired by his example, after I graduated from college, I set off on a 16th month spiritual odyssey around the world. Um, and I really traversed the Buddhist world in Japan, Tibet, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, India. Um, but at the end of my globe trotting, I came to the startling realization that no matter how far I had traveled and how much I had seen, my real journey was a pilgrimage inward, deep inside myself to find myself. And years later, my Buddhist mentor echoed a similar sentiment. His whole life he had wanted to become an astronaut, to go where no man had gone before. But he realized when he was in the US Air Force Academy that no matter how far he left, how far away he went from this planet, he could never leave his own mind. And that the real adventure was the lifelong journey to find himself. And the real revolution was a revolution of the mind. More than any other Buddhist teacher today, Noah is a true spiritual revolutionary. And he challenges us to think about the revolution that happens in the life of the mind. His own profound life trajectory progressed from heartbreak and hopelessness to wisdom and compassion, from addiction and, in, in, and incarceration to liberation and redemption. He was inspired by the path of the Buddha himself, who was the ultimate spiritual revolutionary. The Buddha rebelled against his predetermined fate. He rejected caste obligations and gender-based restrictions. He renounced his worldly riches. He resisted the hedonism and materialism around him. And he challenged and deconstructed the most popular philosophical ideas of his time. As the original Dharma punk, Noah too rejected the entrenched authority and conventional wisdom around him. And despite the suffering he's endured on his path, he has emerged awakened as did the Buddha, 
with clarity and purpose, and with innovation and intentionality. Like the Buddha, Noah shows us how we can be proactive in constructing our own reality and mitigating our own suffering. And he challenges us to explore our internal world through meditation, introspection, and reflection. For centuries, Buddhism has been transmitted from country to country, and with each new inc incarnation, Buddhism changes to reflect the culture of the new host country while retaining the timeless truths of the Buddha's teachings. Noah represents a new Buddhist frontier, one that is uniquely American and that speaks directly to Generation X and the millennial generation. In the lineage of other gr great American Buddhists, such as Jack Kerouac, Jack Cornfield, and his own father, Stephen Levine, Noah is a signpost for us, pointing us to a new American consciousness focused on the cultivation of wisdom and the practice of compassion. He is also the author of two popular books, Dharma Punks and Against the Stream, and after our event today, he'll be signing the books. You can purchase them um, here. Um, and he's the uh, subject of the new documentary, Meditate and Destroy. Today's talk will be followed by a question and answer, a book signing, and a reception with food, so we invite you to stay for the whole event. And uh, now it gives me great pleasure, and please join me in welcoming to USC, Noah Levine. How's it going? I'm not used to this sort of podium lecture uh, situation. I usually teach from uh, sitting on a cushion during meditation uh, because I believe that speaking about Buddhism has a little bit of like speaking about swimming. You're never going to learn how to swim unless you get in the water. And so I truly believe that uh, Buddhism is an experience. It's actually not, sometimes we like to say, some people even like to say Buddhism isn't really a religion, it's just a philosophy. Uh, I disagree. I don't even think it's a philosophy. I think it's an action. It's an experience. It's a uh, uh, experiential philosophy, but not to just be read about or talked about or uh, but really to be done. So maybe we could start with just a couple of minutes of meditation. And you don't have to do anything special. Just sit there. And if you care to close your eyes, close your eyes if you want to, but you don't have to. But just pay total attention to the present moment. What's happening right now, if you let go of memory and planning? Let go of all of your concepts and ideas, constructs, and observe directly your mind, your body. Feel your breath, breathing in. Let go of the past. Let go of the future. Breathing out. Try to bring a sense of kindness, of compassion, mercy, Forgiveness to yourself. Feel your body here and now in this chair. Experience gravity. Pulling you. And notice how the mind does whatever it wants, even though you keep telling it to shut up.
when you're ready, bringing your attention back into the room, allowing your eyes to open if you've closed them. And maybe that's not much, but at least uh, it's putting a toe in the water. If we're going to talk about swimming for the next hour, uh, at least uh, getting your feet a little bit wet of, of doing uh, Buddha. This experience, this uh, term that Varun uh, said means to be awake. It's kind of, sort of strange that we close our eyes to be awake, though, isn't it? It's kind of counter to... Usually we say, well, when we, we wake up, we open our eyes. Uh, of course, uh, in this context... There's something very important about bringing full attention inward to see what have we been asleep to within ourselves? What has our waking life distracted us from uh, of internal realities? And so sometimes closing our eyes, going into stillness, allows us to actually be awake to something, to see clearly, see reality clearly. So uh, I guess that's what we're here to discuss a little bit this evening. I'll give you a brief background. Uh, but actually, before I, I talk about myself, I'm curious about you. Um, how many people are meditators? Do you, do you meditate? Some of you meditate. Uh, how many of you are pretty familiar with Buddhism, like you at least know what the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path is? Some of you, most of you? A lot of people who don't meditate at least have read the books. They know that. Any of you actual, uh, actual, real, live Buddhists? Identify as Buddhism as your religion, as your spiritual path, as your... Okay. Uh, I could raise my hand to all of those. Uh, although I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Over the last little over 20 years of studying and practicing Buddhism, I've become less and less identified with uh, being a Buddhist and, and more and more interested in becoming Buddha-like and not so interested in being religious, but very interested in being happy, very interested in being kind, and generous and forgiving and wise. I'd like to be more compassionate than I am. Uh, religion can inspire us towards all of those things, but uh, I've also come to see how uh, often religion gets so uh, solidified that it misses the humanity, the humanness, the potential of the individual and starts to put these sort of rules and dogmatic observations. We start talking about stuff rather than doing it. So for the la about, uh, about 21 years ago, I started meditating, practicing Buddhist meditation. I grew up with uh, a father who was a, a meditator and uh, very interested and involved in Buddhism. But I was pretty sure that Buddhism and meditation in general was a waste of time. I remember being a kid thinking, like, you're just sitting there with your eyes closed. That sort of like, don't just sit there. Do something, anything. Pay attention to me, goddammit. <laughs> Enough of this meditation. And I didn't know what it was about, and my parents... Uh, mostly, I think, in a good way, didn't force their spiritual beliefs or religions upon me or my siblings. They modeled them, they practiced them, but they didn't really say, you have to do this or you have to believe this. Uh, which in some ways, I feel, in my own life's experience, was like giving me enough rope to hang myself because uh, I took that sort of freedom and, and non-boundaries... Uh, non and I uh, created a life of suffering for myself. And I was convinced that if I could just 
find the right mixture of drugs that I'd be happy. And I was convinced that if I could just get the right amount of attention, that I'd be happy. And uh, I, I, I chased drugs and attention and uh, crime and violence to a place that just, uh, just about killed me and some other people. And at 17 years old, my father said, maybe you should try meditation. Clearly, your way isn't working. The drugs, the violence, the crime, you're in jail again for the 12th time. Are you happy? And clearly, my answer was, I'm not happy. I want to be happy, but uh, I don't know how to find it. My father said, well, maybe meditation will help. I said, thanks, Dad. How about some real help? Could you get me a lawyer, maybe? <laughs> this meditation shit again? But as I began to, uh, out of that sort of hopelessness, and it's a long story uh, I could get stuck in, so I'm trying to give you the overview. But out of the experience of meditating, it didn't make sense to me, theoretically. I wasn't dis interested in being Buddhist or being religious, but I was suffering, and I was very interested in suffering less. I was stressed out. I was afraid. I was angry. I was desperate. And my dad said, just pay attention to your breath. Just breathing in, let go of the future, just like I just told you guys, let go of the past. Just focus totally in the present moment. And I don't know what you guys experienced tonight when you did that, or many of you have been meditating for a while, but I'll tell you that for me, it was such a relief. When I started to just focus in the present moment, uh, the past was really unpleasant. I had created so much drama and suffering in my life. I had so much resentment. I had so much anger and fear about the past. And the future was even worse. It was going to, whatever it was, it was going to be worse. Or a delusional fantasy about, I'll be happy when I get the stuff. But at that time, when I started meditating, I'd sort of exhausted most of my hope for happiness in what we could call the material world. I had sort of, uh, maybe similarly to the Buddha, had had this sort of experience of, uh, it's all sickness and death and suffering. Happiness isn't going to exist out there. I know that's a sort of nihilistic, maybe depressing realization. But for me, it was incredibly liberating to stop looking outside of myself for happiness. To stop trying to find it in getting high, to find it in getting laid, to find it in stuff. And to say, oh, in this moment, when I just pay attention to my breath, in the present moment, there's some relief from the suffering that my mind creates or that I create with my mind. It was a revelation to me. First time in my life, I don't know if you know this yet, but you actually don't have to obey your mind. I didn't know that, <laughs> which is why I was in jail. Because my mind said steal and I stole and my mind said fight and I fought. My mind said, crack sounds good, and I smoked crack. Because I did whatever my mind suggested. And as I began to meditate, I started to see, oh, my mind uh, is a bit of a jerk. <laughs> not very wise, not very smart, and not very... Uh, compassionate or merciful. 
It just wants pleasure all of the time at any consequence. It just wants to escape pain all of the time at any consequence. And usually this chasing pleasure, escaping pain, has caused more pain in my life. Cause more stress, more fear, more difficulties. So that first experience of meditation gave me hope that maybe there was some sort of internal experience uh, that would bring some level of satisfaction. And it uh, gave me some faith that maybe life didn't have to be so difficult. Maybe there was some tools that could be applied, even to my extreme circumstances at the time, that would be helpful. And they, they were helpful. And I saw for myself, this isn't theory, this isn't philosophy, this is experience. This shit works for a half a breath at a time. That's the problem with meditation. It's not like you can just say, okay, I'm gonna meditate, now mind shut up. <laughs> and your mind says, yeah, right. And it only works for that half a moment when you pay attention to the breath and then the mind wanders and then you come back and then it does whatever it wants. It judges you and judges someone else and then you come back over and over. But that moment of returning, of reconnecting with the present moment, uh, and as we start to do that and connect and sustain, we start to see the world more clearly, start to come into more harmony with reality, start to be more awake, more Buddha-like. And not Buddha in the statues or the uh, you know, religious icons, but Buddha as in your direct experience, our direct experience of not suffering about reality, which means living in harmony with what's happening right now. Responding with the appropriate response, <laughs> with the wise response. I didn't even know about Buddhism yet, really, when I started meditating. I just knew this mindfulness stuff really worked. And it is something that the Buddha taught. It took me a while, but over the um, years, I got interested in really studying Buddhism. And even this term Buddhism, it's confusing, isn't it? What kind of Buddhism should I study? Right? If you're interested in Buddhism now, it's a conundrum. Well, should I be a Tibetan Buddhist? They're pretty cool. They got the fancy dresses. The Dalai Lama's a rock star. Love him. Dude's awesome. Should I become a Zen Buddhist? I like them. They got the black clothes, bowing, tatami mats, good style, minimalism. I like it. Should I become a Theravadan Buddhist? A Thai, I like their, their saffron robes, Thai temples, Burmese, Sri Lankan. I don't know if you uh, play with this conversation much, if you're, if you're down this level of interest in Buddhism, but for me it was quite uh, confusing because I knew, oh, I want to be uh, this Buddhism. I want to be a Buddhist. I, uh, meditation works. I, I'm also I'm, I'm an addict. Everything, right? I don't get one tattoo. I'm going to get covered in tattoos, whole body suit. Right? I'm not going to meditate once in a while. I'm going to become a Buddhist. I'm going to get enlightened before you. <laughs> right? Also a little competitive in there. So this term Buddhism, I've come to find, uh, means a hundred different things to a hundred different people. And there's so, like all, you know, it, uh, if it's become a religion, 
and it is the, a huge religion. It's not a theistic religion. It's not a God-based religion like most religions are. It's different than most of the Western, what we call Western religions. But it's still a religion. And what they uh, talk about in Tibet is similar, but a lot different than what they talk about in China or Japan. And what they talk about in Thailand is similar, but a lot different than what they talk about in Tibet. And so there's all of these Buddhisms, the southern schools, the northern schools. I became very interested, and I still am very interested in uh, finding out who the Buddha was and what he taught. I'm, I'm like that in general. I don't know if any of you are like that, but I like old school shit. I want to go back to the roots. You know, when, when I started listening to punk rock, I want to hear what were the roots of punk rock? What were the punk rockers listening to? Right? Who did the Ramones like? MC5? Stooges? I'm like that with Buddhism too. When I think of the Dalai Lama, like, okay, what did his teachers, teachers, teachers... Where's the roots of this? What's the foundation? Now, many people will say, well, that's Theravadan Buddhism. That's the southern school or Hinayana tradition, some people call it. But I'm not even sure that that's true. I think that there's actually a layer beneath the Theravadan tradition. The Theravadin is also this sort of religious superstructure built upon what the Buddha taught. So is Mahayana, Zen, Vajrayana, Pure Land. But I'm more and more interested in uh, really uh, becoming awake and really looking at what did this uh, original gangster Siddhartha Gautama, what did he teach? How did he live? And what in the scriptures are actually his words and what are clearly later uh, overlays, uh, commentaries? Now here's uh, what I think is most important and I believe is central to every Buddhist school. I could be wrong because I'm not a scholar on all schools of Buddhism. Um, but I believe it's central to all of them. And I believe that it is the core of the Buddha's experience and teaching. And Actually, I think that it's enough. And that is the four truths and the eightfold path. I believe that that is a completely and total map not only for our personal transformation, for less suffering, for more happiness, and for actual, uh, this, this third truth, Nibbana, or Nirvana, for actual, uh, an end of suffering in our lives. I believe that the Eightfold Path of the Buddha uh, is also a, a map on some level for societal transformation, for a cultural shift, for a positive sh change in the world. That the Buddha was teaching personal liberation. If you do this, you will not suffer so much. If you are mindful, if you are kind, if you are forgiving, if you are generous, if you live in harmony with impermanence, if you stop resisting change, accept change more, you'll suffer less. You'll find more happiness, more freedom. But also, uh, as a group, as a, what we call Sangha, as a community, and maybe even as a culture, as a society, the eightfold path of understanding and intentions that are based on wisdom, wise understanding, wise intentions, practice of nonviolence in our actions and our livelihood. practice of uh, being careful with our speech, with our sexuality, with intoxicants. 
and trying effort through meditation and mindfulness and in concentrating the mind, that this will not only transform your life, but that if we do it together, it will transform our society. It will transform. There, there's a potential here, a map here for uh, uh, change in the world. It's incredibly inspiring to me and uh, brought me personally from a place of hopelessness to a place of hope from a place of meaninglessness to a place of great meaning through direct experience. Not because it sounded good in a book, but because uh, as I applied mindfulness, I was like, okay, this works. It's hard, but it works. I can train my mind. I can ignore my mind. I can defy my mind. And as I saw and followed this eightfold path, and began to understand how everything's impermanent. Understand everything's impermanent. Not through your mind, understand it directly within your being. And because that's a truth, like gravity, <laughs> not a philosophy, <laughs> not a thought system, a undisputable truth, What is also seems to be true is that we live out of sync with them, with impermanence. We continue to cling <laughs> to impermanent things. We continue to get attached to people, to places, to experiences, and we suffer. The Buddha said, you know, this, this path is simple, it is subtle, but it also is completely counter to human survival instinct. We're born into a mind-body process that naturally craves for and clings to pleasure. It's in order to survive, you have to love pleasure. In order to survive, you have to hate pain. Your body does it all by itself without any help from you. <laughs> Your mind, your body, we are just wired like that. We're animals, our so-called evolved human experience is one of animal survival instinct at its base. And the Buddha said, you know, this dharma, dharma meaning truth, this truth, this path to truth, to nirvana, to liberation, is one that goes against this natural human stream. That's going to be difficult. It's going to take a lot of effort to defy our own survival instincts. From a Buddhist perspective, we are not born to be happy. Happiness is not your birthright. Did you figure that one out already? You don't get to be happy just because you're alive. Happiness takes work takes psychological, spiritual, emotional intelligence. It doesn't happen all by itself. It takes effort to be happy. And we have to make sure we're putting our effort uh, into the correct venues, the correct ways. For true happiness, you know, and a Buddhist happiness is more probably like peace or contentment. It's not the sort of blissful, everything feels good all of the time, happiness. It's not the, I'm getting my way all of the time. I always get what I want, so I'm happy. That's the kind of happiness that says, I accept life as it is. I try to get what I want. <laughs> I have goals. I work hard for my material desires, for my sensual desires, but I also accept that I'm just not that powerful. I just don't get to control everything all of the time. Is all of this making any sense? I feel like I'm a little scattered. Matthew, am I scattered? <laughs> Truth meter is lying. Six forty. A few more minutes, and then open it up.
one of the things that I'm interested in lately, and my colleague uh, Matthew, who's here, and, and uh, is the what's your title? The something of the Buddhist group. He's the he's the religious director of the Buddhist group here on campus, and he and I teach together sometimes. And last week we talked about mercy uh, and what that meant from a Buddhist context, because this term mercy. I think it's very important. What's it mean to be merciful? But it's not used that much in a Buddhist context. It has a kind of a Western religious context usually. To me, mercy means to stop hurting someone that you're hurting. The dictionary definition actually says that mercy means to be compassionate towards someone that you have power over. My experience of uh, practicing med Buddhist meditation and living uh, a life along Buddhist principles has been an act of mercy. It has helped me to stop hurting myself in all of the subtle ways that we hurt ourselves. through attachment, through aversion, craving, judgment, self-critical thinking and taking it all personally. It's been an act of mercy to become mindful, to wake up to what's really happening here so that I don't hurt myself so much. And as I've stopped hurting myself so much, I've also uh, stopped hurting others so much. So I really begun to think of Buddhism as an act of mercy. Not the kind of external, have mercy on us, but the internal, have mercy on yourself. You have the power to end suffering in your life. It takes a lot of work. You have to meditate. You have to meditate to truly end suffering. You're not going to ever, we are not going to ever think our way around this uh, life situation that we're in, around this body. Uh, we just don't have, the mind doesn't have the power w unless it's trained. And meditation is a mind training. It's an act of kindness, an act of generosity to yourself and to this world and to the potential for a shift in your family, in your friends, in your society. Each one of us makes uh, kind of ripple effects. I've seen it so clearly in my life that over these 20 years of uh, practicing, these last few years of teaching, uh, what a big change it's made in, in my family my friends, what a positive offering my transformation has been to others. And in this way, I don't think Buddhism applied correctly is at all selfish. I think uh, quite the reverse. It's an act of, of mercy towards the world. And what's it mean if we have the power to end suffering in ourselves but we're too lazy to do the work. To me, it means that the stream of greed and hatred and ignorance is strong. And that in this world, very, very few people are willing to do the work to go against the stream, to go against greed and against hatred, against their own delusions and the delusions of these false promises of happiness through material gain. It's so fucking disappointing when you get everything that you want and it doesn't work. 
It's so great to get everything that you want and not be attached to it and just enjoy it, knowing that everything is impermanent, subject to change. These are some of the things that Buddhism has taught me. And uh, I'll leave it there for the lecture part, but really happy to have a conversation with you and uh, dialogue about any questions, comments that you have, directions that you would like to take this conversation to make it uh, real in your life rather than my, my thoughts. So I see some hands. Should I just do the hands or do you want to? Okay. Please, sir. You were surprisingly self revelatory when as a public speaker, not as a person talking to another person privately, but in public, you admitted that you would like to be more compassionate. Could you reveal a little bit of the fullness of that? How might you want to be more compassionate? And I don't mean generally. Sure, specific. Well, let me define compassion in order to kind of, I like your question very much. Mer mercy, well, mercy, I'd actually define mercy and compassion separately. Compassion is responding to pain with kindness and love rather than aversion and hatred. My experience is that my body's natural tendency is to meet pain with hatred. And when I am experiencing unpleasant sensations and emotions and thoughts, that I get agitated and usually push against them. First, you know, as I was saying, I believe that this is our survival instinct, and I see how strong that is in me, and that sometimes I have the capacity to pause and to tolerate the pain. Now that pause is the moment of mercy to me is the moment of, okay, I'm starting to cause some real suffering on top of this pain. Let me stop. Compassion is a whole nother level of really meeting it with a heartfelt care. Sometimes I'm successful at that. I find that often in my life, um, I'm better at tolerance than I am at love. And I actually believe that this tolerating uh, is a stage on its way to love or on its way to compassion. My goal is to meet every unpleasant experience in my life with love, with compassion, with kindness. I'm not there yet. <laughs> That's what I was talking about, uh, is that I have this total intention to be compassionate all of the time, even when they cut me off on the freeway to have their well-being in mind, to have love, to have compassion for that unpleasant bad driver that I judge. But I don't. That, that's not how I live, actually. I live more like this <laughs> than like this. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's how I, internally I feel anyways, is that uh, uh, I don't hurt people the way that I used to, but I still want to. And I would hope that my Dharma practice, that my Buddhist practice, will get me closer and closer to the place of not wanting to, of actually really seeing uh, every sentient being as precious and as lovable. And I don't, I don't look through those eyes. I l I'd like to look through those eyes. I try to. 20 years into practice, I'm getting better at it, but not all of the time. So that's part of what I meant by I'd like to be more compassionate. I'd like to be more wise. I'd like to be more patient. I've made some progress. You know, the Dalai Lama was once asked, uh, how long does it take to get enlightened, basically? And he, uh, through a series of, of questions, he said, it's different for everyone, so I can't really answer the question, but uh, let me give you a suggestion. He said, if you're serious about wanting enlightenment or happiness, whatever we're talking about here, commit to it fully. Practice meditation, study, discipline. Really, give your life to it. 
and just check in on your progress once every decade because it's going to take a long time. So I see that in my life. I'm two decades into what I call spiritual practice. I've made a lot of progress. I don't steal anymore. I almost never lie, only occasionally white lies to the wife, uh, but almost never. Uh, uh, you know, I haven't been in a violent altercation in almost 20 years and uh, been completely drugged. I've seen a lot of progress. My mind, mostly comfortable in my skin, mostly happy. I'm able to tolerate pain without spilling it out onto others. I'm not compassionate all the time. I'm working towards that. Thank you for your question. What else? Please. Um, you talked about ending suffering you know, in your own life. But yeah. How do you end suffering that comes from other people that are hurting themselves that you don't have any control of? It affects you. Yeah. And does that, it seems like it's almost selfish. Mm -hmm. You want to end your suffering from somebody, from somebody else's. Because if they're not going to end theirs, it's selfish for us to be happy. We should suffer with them. On, I mean, I get it, right? That's Because if we really, if we follow that, there's this sort of confused idea that, well, maybe uh, I should suffer with them. Uh, my experience is, and my thought, and the Buddha's teaching, I believe, is that it's actually quite good for them, even if they're not going to do what they need to do to end their suffering. If you do what you need to do to end your suffering or to suffer less, it will be an inspiration. It will be an uh, example in their life that it's at least possible, because most of us are so hopeless. We feel like it's just not, happiness is just a fantasy. Because we don't know very many people that are very genuinely happy, very, you know, uh, consistently most of the time. Most of the people we know are pretty much asleep, like us. You know, happy when it's pleasurable, sad when it's painful, just doing whatever the mind tells us to do. But if you become uh, one of these people that has more freedom in your life, your friends, your family, your associates will really notice it. And they'll really say, wow, she's doing something. That meditation, something's working for her. She's got some inner resources that I don't have. It's not a guarantee that whoever it is that you're talking about is going to get their shit together. But I think it leads more towards a potential that they will or that they might, or that they, at least they will have an example in their life of somebody really doing the work. Now, the other piece of that is I've talked a little bit about compassion. Compassion, the wise response to pain. The flip side of compassion is that the Buddha said, be careful here. Make sure you have equanimity along with your compassion. Sometimes in Buddhist compassion practices, we'll wish, may all beings be free from suffering. And we have this aspiration to liberate all sentient beings so that may everyone be happy. May everyone be met with kindness, with compassion. Like I was just saying, I have that aspiration. But the Buddha says, now be careful because you don't actually have the power to liberate other people or beings from their suffering. You do have the power to protect people from physical harm. You do have the power to educate people, to inspire people, like I was just saying, to support, to encourage. But when it comes to the core causes of human suffering, which are inside of us, not outside of us, the experience of greed and attachment, the experience of hatred and aversion, it's in us. And nobody can take that away from you except for you. And you can't take that away from anyone else. Does that make sense? Equanimity is this teaching from the Buddha. It's a little bit like the Western prayer, the serenity prayer. Do you know that? Prayer that says something like, um, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference between the two. Right? So that's so much of what equanimity is pointing towards. The, the, the serenity to accept. I can't change anyone but myself. Without using that as a cop-out, 
I can't change you, but I can support you. I can encourage you. I can educate you. I can point you in the right direction. But you've got to do the work yourself. And I'm basically powerless over whether or not you are going to practice some compassion towards yourself, some kindness. Whether you're going to be merciful or not is out of my hands. I can only encourage you to. So that's a, a balance to compassion. I want you to. I want everyone to. But I understand my limitations. I'm not a superhero. And sometimes in Buddhism, we get these sort of pictures. Bodhisattva. Dun, 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 dun. I'm here to save all sentient beings from suffering. I like the um, Japanese uh, way of saying that the best. I think it's called the, we do have a scholar here. I think the five vows uh, in Japanese and Zen Buddhism when they say, beings are numberless. I vow to save them all. <laughs> Suffering is endless. I vow to end it all. I forget the other three. <laughs> Not my tradition. But I really like that a lot because it points towards I'm trying to do the impossible. And there's a sort of sense of humor in it. It's endless. I'm going to end it all. Numberless, and I'm going to save them all. Yeah, right. But I'm willing to try with the humility that knows I, I can't, actually. Was that speak to it mostly? Yeah. Anything else? Sure, in the back. I do my best, you know, the, the kind of, I guess, Theravadan Southern School of Buddhism uh, suggests that non monastics, uh, householders, lay people like us, that if we're interested in following the Buddhist path, that we adhere at the very minimum to the five precepts, which are. Uh, not killing, and some would translate as nonviolence. Uh, not stealing, or only taking that which is offered. Not lying, or speaking honestly. Uh, and abstaining from uh, drugs and alcohol, and abstaining from any kind of sexual activity that's going to cause harm to yourself or to another being. Um, so I do my best to live by those precepts. Maybe the one, and, and you know, which is also the kind of right action in the Eightfold Path. Probably the right speech is the most challenging for me. Yep. Um, as a writer, do you ever use writing as a form of meditation? Do you write? Yeah. I use it as a frustration meditation. Yeah. Sometimes I do. There are those moments in writing where I can feel really connected and even empty where it's just sort of the words are flowing through. Um, but often I find writing to be sort of tedious. I like to speak to people. I'm not that interested in sitting in front of my computer for hours and hours at a time. As you all know, you're in school. <laughs> or most of you are anyway. Um, so there's some meditation to it, some concentration. It's not quite the same as a stillness practice of just kind of an internal uh, investigation or observation because it's such a mental process of what's the word and what's it connected to. And uh, there's so much thinking involved in it that it could be considered a form of meditation, but it's different than the meditations that I usually do. Of course, ultimately... Our goal is to bring mindfulness to and meditation to every activity. Not just sitting and paying attention to the breath, but if you're writing, being mindful of writing and of the mind's process and the body's process of the typing. And so it becomes a meditation, just like driving and uh, walking and everything else that we do becomes a meditation with the, the kind of correct mindfulness applied to it. So, yes and no. Please. 
I was just wondering, uh, in a lot of religions there's the idea of the eternal, and you said that Buddhism is founded on, on uh, the idea that everything is changing and that you can't hold on to anything, but is there any concept of the eternal in Buddhism at all? We'll have to be careful with this. I think the way to answer it is in Buddhism, yes. In the teachings of the Buddha, no. But I think that we could find lots of different things from different schools of Buddhism where they self to say things like emptiness is eternal. <laughs> Or nirvana is eternal or something like that. But it's not the way that the Buddha talked about any of it, as far as I understand, as far as I know. Nothing in samsara. Samsara is the Buddhist word for this world, the conditioned world. Everything within the conditioned world is subject to con change, condition, arising, passing. The Buddha does, uh, on some level, or Buddhism, I'm not sure if it's Buddha or Buddhism, <laughs> on some level, points to Nibbana being uh, outside of samsara, freedom from samsara, extinguishing. Samsara means the cycle of wandering. Enlightenment ends the wandering, especially parinirvana, which means when you die, <laughs> when your body dies, no more rebirth, no more wandering in this cycle of, of birth. So could we say that that's permanently outside of, I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Of course, there's that maybe a little bit more Western perspective that says the only uh, constant <laughs> uh, is, is change itself. <laughs> I mean, just the word religion needs to bind back, and so there would have to be some kind of uh, sacred reality that is eternal that you're trying to bind oneself to. In order to call it a religion? Well, I mean, not even just to call it a religion, but to call it, I don't know, I mean, to, to seek it at all. I mean, would have to, I mean, truth is, I mean, the, the truth of it, could that be considered eternal, you know? I guess so. In eternal, you mean permanent. You're, uh, it's the, I guess so. I mean, you, you hear translations that say, this is the eternal truth. This is the truth, I guess. This is the permanent truth. <laughs> the truth doesn't change. I guess. I don't know. Do you, why do you ask? Is there any specific pertinence to it or just sort of curious? Just sort of curious. I don't follow any one religion, uh, but... I think they're all incredibly interesting because, you know, there is something that you're trying to, you know, find your way back to, you know, there is something that you're trying to remember. And uh, I don't know, it's just really interesting because without an idea of eternity or something specific that lasts forever, then how are the words of the Buddha good, not only in the time that he spoke them, but in the time that, that you have read them and, and in the times that come after? Yeah, I mean, I think that so much of what the Buddha is pointing towards is not some permanent state or, or, or reconnecting to some sort of permanent state, but is learning to live in this body, in this mind, in this world, the way that it is. I think it's much more humanist than many of the religions that are talking about connecting to some ec other but it's just about if you're mindful, you can live in this body, in this lifetime, in reality, in a way of happiness, in a way of well-being. If you become more compassionate, if you become less attached, this is a map for living in this lifetime. So maybe we could say to reconnecting uh, to some kind of balance. They call it the middle path, right? This balance. It's not a transcendent path. It's a uh, <laughs> descendant path, <laughs> grounding. 
No, I mean, it seems like it's the opposite of reconnecting to something, but of disconnecting from yeah. things, from yourself. Although I've often talked about it as a, a, a sort of archaeological process, especially with the heart qualities of compassion and kindness and love and generosity, that I think that so often that survival instinct that we were talking about, that I was talking about earlier, is that we suppress a lot of the kind of heart qualities of love and compassion, and that the meditative practices uh, and the precepts, the kind of not only what we do, but also what we restrain ourselves from doing, what we don't do, uh, allow us to slowly uncover or recover some heart qualities that were buried. Some part of our uh, natural kind of what in, in later Buddhism becomes called uh, the Buddha nature that's within all of us. That's not a term that the Buddha used, but it points towards the teaching of the Buddha where he said, all beings have the potential. Everyone can do this, can be happy if they're willing to go against the stream and do the hard work of changing their relationship to their own minds and bodies and this world. So in that way, it is an uncovering or a reconnecting to something internal. Please. Uh, did the Buddha uh, teach about reincarnation and karma and the idea of karma moving with you from one lifetime to the next? Or was that something that was picked up in India? Well, you know, I just came back this last week. I spent uh, five days studying with Stephen Batchelor, uh, who's a wonderful teacher and practitioner and scholar. He wrote a great book called Buddhism Without Beliefs, where he really encourages uh, a kind of Buddhist agnosticism rather than believing in karma and reincarnation. Just question it, you know, really kind of be a Buddhist agnostic rather than a faithful. The Buddha said it, so it must be true. <laughs> now, he says that he doesn't think that belief in, in karma and reincarnation are necessary for liberation. You don't have to believe in that to really benefit from the spiritual practices around Buddhism. This week, when he was talking, he was saying, uh, let's really look at what the Buddha definitely taught and was original to him. Karma and reincarnation are ancient, pre-Buddhist, Indian thought. He said, let's set that to the side. He said, let's also set to the side everything that came after the Buddha, Nargajuna, all of the Tibetan scholars, uh, Dogen, all of the Japanese, other Buddhist uh, teachers. And let's, let's just look at, at the Buddha's teachings. I said, uh, he said, I find four, four things original to the Buddhism, uh, to the Buddha that did not exist before. Uh, and that were new as far as he could tell in his 40 years of studying. And this is a man who was a Tibetan monk for 15 years and then spent 10 years in a Zen monastery and then, you know, kind of came back and said, I want to get to the foundation of this stuff. What, what did the Buddha actually teach now that I've learned what Tibetans think and what the Koreans think? So what's clear in that? Oh, was I going to give you the four things? Uh, the four things that the Buddha actually were original to him. Uh, dependent co-arising is uh, uh, or dependent origination, original Buddhist thought. Uh, the four noble truths, original Buddhist thought. Uh, mindfulness. And the way that he taught this sort of training of present time awareness, original to the Buddha. And what was the fourth? Oh, uh, this pow self uh, power for personal liberation. This uh, nothing, you don't need anything outside of you. No external, no higher power, no God. Total personal uh, uh, power for liberation. He thought that was original to Siddhartha Gautama. 
So he le leaves out uh, karma and reincarnation because it did was taught in Indian thought. Um, now that having been said, it's all through the Pali canon. It definitely, uh, in the earliest sources and the most sure sources, it definitely came out of the Buddha's mouth. It wasn't just added later by commentaries. It was definitely something that the Buddha talked about. Whether he believed it completely or he just sort of included it because it was the language of the people and he used it as analogy uh, uh, is questionable. But he definitely taught it on one level or another. He definitely spoke about rebirth and the cycle of reincarnation. His question is, uh, for people who are considering studying or becoming Buddhist, what would I recommend, where do we start kind of thing. Like I said earlier, it's such a, it's a difficult proposition because what kind of Buddhist? Do you want to study Zen? you want to study Tibetan Buddhism, Theravadan Buddhism, Pure Land Buddhism, Sogo Gokai? you want to chant, you want to meditate, you want to... Uh, just study, you know, it's, it depends. I think that there's something incredibly wise about doing your own sort of uh, investigation and uh, kind of compare, doing your own sort of comparative religion, comparative Buddhist religion experiment. There's a one, there's a good, there's lots of books to read, but one book that I always suggest people read because there's a problem here. Any book you read is going to tell you that their tradition's the best. Everyone else sucks, but we're the best. Right? There's a book um, by Houston Smith and Stephen Novak. Philip Novak. Philip, or Philip Novak and Houston Smith called Buddhism a Concise Introduction. And they're more, they're kind of scholars, but they're also practitioners. And Houston Smith um, practiced Zen Buddhism and uh, studied in the Mahayana mostly with Tibetan and Japanese traditions. And Philip Novak studied Theravada and Vipassana. And they wrote this book together. They're both professors, I think, at, at Berkeley, UC Berkeley, or were. Houston Smith's still alive? I don't know, 90-something. Is he? Yeah. Yeah. Good book. They do uh, an overview. They say this is uh, what we know about the Buddha, what he, how he lived, what he taught, and then this is what we know about how Buddhism was developed, right? And this is the creation of Theravada and of Mahayana and of Chan and Zen and Pure Land, and they give a pretty good overview of the different traditions, and it's not very biased, I don't think. Then again. I liked it, so it might have just fit with my own biases. <laughs> I have to admit that, too, because I don't like a lot of the Buddhist literature I, I read, but I like that it felt pretty open, pretty comparative, uh, pretty fair to all of the different traditions. What do you mean by Alan Wise? Wise. I was inspired by a lot of his stuff. You know, he might have been one, of, you know, he's one of those guys that's in that category of, uh, wow, he really could say it, but was he living it? And, and there's a few of these guys, uh, you know, Alan, for instance, is a notorious alcoholic drinker. You know, just this person who, by everyone that I know that knew him and that, you know, is that he just drank constantly. And he's one of these guys, and there's other Buddhist characters like that, but what he said was amazing. Really incredible wisdom. But his something, his behavior, maybe wasn't in line with what the Buddha would have encouraged <laughs> for a Dharma teacher. Then again, my uh, behavior is probably not always in line with what the Buddha would encourage for a Dharma teacher either. So I don't want to get too high on my pedestal here. But I think that Alan Watts' teachings are really very cool. And, and he, he, his lecture is really amazing. To check him out. Yeah, and that's mostly a Japanese Buddhist perspective. Great to check out Zen. 
But then even here in Los Angeles, uh, come to our center. Try it for two or three times. We mostly have this sort of Theravada and Vipassana type of practice. Go to LA Zen Center. Try it two or three times. See how you like it. Learn some of the Japanese. Go to Shambhala. J uh, Tibetan practice. Check that out. Go to, uh, there's a couple of other Tibetan places around that you could check out. Check out some Tibetan Buddhism. Personally, I really think that that's best. Go taste it for yourself, try it, and then settle and say, okay, this is what fits for me. This is the one that I like the best. Uh, and then, you know, try that for 10 years and then go and try something else for 10 years. In the 60s, a lot of the people who experimented with acid were later led, uh, led to meditation and then later dismissed acid use and uh, that whole lifestyle. What do you think of the parallels between like acid use, the experience of acid and meditation? I don't know so much because I took a lot of acid. <laughs> but I never meditated on it. You know, it was all of my drug use was pre-spiritual practice. So what the kind of the hippies, the 60s experim experimentation was so much different than mine. And so I don't have direct experience to speak from on it, really. Um, I think that it's possible that there's been some, you know, uh, really positive integration of uh, psychedelic and hallucination, hallucinatory experience with, with spiritual practice, for sure. I, but I think that, like you said, most of those guys that did that, Richard Alpert and you know, Ram Dass and Timothy Leary, most of them ended up saying, like, it'll open the door, but don't keep using it to open the door. Then walk through with spiritual practice. Don't, you don't, don't think that the drug is, is what you need for your transformation. It won't get you there. It'll just give you a glimpse maybe of what's possible. That having been said, uh, I'm not encouraging drug use <laughs> at all. And I have two or three, two and a half close friends. Can you have a half a close friend? I know a few people that really never came back from, from acid trips. And so I think it can be safe generally but really dangerous for some uh, and that uh, if you don't have the right kind of mind constitution sometimes those sort of hallucinatory uh, psychedelic drugs can really fuck you up for all, forever make you know create a psychotic break or something like that so uh, I think there's some danger in it too not for everybody but for some If Buddhism observes a detachment from the material, why do we not see more Buddhists like owning one pair of clothes or living on the street? Mm. This is a really important question, I think, because the question was uh, if Buddhism or if the Buddha uh, uh, encouraged a renunciation or, or a non-attachment to material things, why don't we see more Buddhists uh, only having one pair of clothes or living a kind of homeless? You understand? Now, the way that the Buddha encouraged that was if you're going to do that to become a monk or a nun, and then you have uh, one robe that you wear and one that you keep, that's all you get, you know, is kind of one change of clothes. And if you go to Asia, you will see monks and nuns all over the place with their one set of robes. You see it occasionally here in the West. You might see a, a monk or a nun occasionally wandering about on campus. I don't know. But this is important because he didn't encourage that. And I think it's actually quite dangerous to try to live like that level of renunciation as a householder. He kind of encouraged people to choose between the life of a householder or a life of a full renunciate. But to try to pretend like you're uh, a monastic but live in the world with just one t-shirt, it's not very wise actually. It's really quite difficult to do that. You need to be supported by a whole community in order to live that simply and that much renunciation. Um, 
Although, you know, the other part of your comment, which is quite true, is, you know, we see all these homeless people around Los Angeles. And, and probably, and then you see the Buddhists passing them in their Cadillacs, their BMWs, sort of, oh, those homeless people. And we often forget, you know, like Jesus or, or the Buddha, that actually uh, this, our teacher <laughs> was homeless. Actually, homelessness isn't uh, some kind of grave sin <laughs> from a Buddhist perspective. It's actually quite uh, a desirable adventure. There's some teachers who have taken to teaching street retreats. Right now in America, you want to go on a Buddhist retreat, you go off to this $10 million retreat center, you know, and you pay $1,000 to go and meditate. And so the, there's been this sort of movement that we might, we're going to try to do one here in Los Angeles. And I'm quite interested in, although I've never taken it on as a project yet, of street retreats of like, okay, let's do this. Let's go live for five days or a week on the streets like the Buddha did. Let's be homeless, eat at the soup kitchen or beg for your food like the Buddha did every day. Let's really walk in the footsteps of the Buddha. Let's let go of the comfort of the luxury of the home. So there's some, some wisdom to that. The Buddha said there was once a, um, and I don't know how much time we have. Maybe, maybe we'll actually end here, unless there's anything else burning. Uh, one of the main supporters of the Buddha was this very wealthy businessman. And he would give the Buddha, you know, the, the grove and give them food and kind of create their campus, their, their, their monasteries for them. And at one point he came to the Buddha and he said, you know, I got lots of money and I got lots of problems. I said, I, I just want to be a blessing to people like you are. I just want to be helpful said, but I have these businesses and all of these employees and all of this money and all of these stresses, all of these problems. He said, uh, do I have to give up my stuff, my wealth, in order to be happy like you, in order to be a blessing to people? And the Buddha said, absolutely not. And he said, now, hear this clearly. My teaching does not demand that anybody gives up anything except for attachment. He said, if you're attached to your wealth and your power and your stuff, better to throw it away right now to become a monk. Go get a pair of robes right now than to let that stuff poison your heart and create suffering for you. But if you can relate to your stuff without so much clinging, then you can be a blessing to people. Then you'll be a blessing to your employees because you'll be generous, <laughs> because you'll be kind. You'll be a blessing to your family, to your friends. If you're not so attached, you can have your stuff. <laughs> Just don't let it create so much suffering for you. So that's really uh, important, and I think very important to me. And uh, there's another part of that uh, scripture where he goes on to say something about, uh, 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 and if you're going to work, put your whole heart into it. If you're going to study, put your whole heart. In. Don't do it half-assed, is how I hear it. He says, and if you have money, use that money to be a blessing to people. Be generous with you. Don't cling to your wealth. Be generous with your wealth, with your power, with your time, with your energy. He said, and if you don't have money, and if you're uh, of low means, and if you're poor, and if you're destitute, then bear that, accept that in this moment as it is, and don't suffer about it. I think that there's something very common about this question and very dangerous about this, and, and maybe very Western, <laughs> about this sort of pseudo-monasticism and this bumper sticker that says, live simply so that others may simply live. Maybe you've seen it on a Subaru around town. 
I apologize if that's your Subaru. <laughs> Living simply is nice, is wise. But it's not necessary. I think actually uh, there's something really great about saying, you know what, I love uh, investment banking. I'm a nerd, I love numbers, and I'm going to be an investment banker, and I'm going to make lots of money. Love it. If that's your passion, do it. But do something wise with the money that you make. Don't just keep it all. Help others. Be generous. Whatever kind of livelihood that we choose, right livelihood in a Buddhist context is doing what you're passionate about, what you love, as long as it doesn't cause harm to others. As long as you're not, you know, passionate about being a mass murderer. It's cool. So I think we'll leave it there. And thank you so much for your attention.